Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Micah, and I'm normally leading worship. Uh, thankful for Robbie's leadership and the team this morning. And it's just uh, realizing how good it is for my heart to be led. And I just think that's a real good principle to remember, even as Christians, no matter where we're at, we must be following Jesus. We must be following others and, um, and listening to people and taking in what they're sharing with us. And so that's just good for my heart. Uh, Pastor Jeff is in El Salvador this week and working with a leadership team for one of our partnerships there, our mission partnerships that we support. Richard and Jen Mullinax are there in El Salvador with a team, and Pastor Jeff and Marilee worked with that team this week. Um, they've been through some uh, real difficult times in recent months, and so they've been talking about how to be resilient in ministry, how to come back from disappointments. Um, so just keep them in your prayers. But we are in a series at MAC on the Spirit-Filled Life, and I hope that uh, this series has been meaningful for you. I hope that uh, truly that God has opened your heart throughout this series to a greater sense of His love for you, and also just a greater desire for His presence. That's a theme that we have been hearing about in the last weeks, and even in the music that we sing, God, more of your presence in my life. And so I, I trust and hope that that's happening for you. Today we're going to look at common obstacles that we face in living the Spirit-filled life. And uh, with the hopes of, of sort of uh, painting a picture, though, what I'd like to do first is to paint a picture of the life that Jesus has for each one of us, the life that He wants, so that we will have an idea what we're missing out on with these obstacles. You see, if we just focus on the obstacles and we forget about the life that God promises, we're just going to have an academic study, and we're going to learn more information this morning. But, uh, but I want to just be able to paint this picture and sort of stir up our hearts to remember where we're going. So at the beginning of the series, if you'll remember, we learned that it is better to have the Holy Spirit living inside us than if Jesus himself were to be sitting here in the front row this morning. Do you believe that? That's what Jesus said. It is the best case scenario for a Christian to be filled with the Spirit, to be led by the Holy Spirit, than to have Jesus right there by his or her side all the time. And we learned in the series that the whole point of even having the Holy Spirit is to be united with Jesus. That's why it's better. We're not just next to Jesus. We are in Jesus. And Jesus is in us. And that is what we have heard called abiding remaining in Him as He remains in us. We then, in our series, we looked at some of the evidences of if you're really remaining in Jesus, if you're, if you're living this life, some evidences, some fruits are going to come out. And one of those fruits is the gifts of the Spirit. Basically, that God gives His children gifts, spiritual gifts. Some of them are, are teaching and administration and prophecy and these different things that the Bible talks about, not so that we can just enjoy them, as individuals, but so that we can use them to build up other people, so that we can use them to glorify God. That is one of the fruits of being filled with the Spirit and walking by the Spirit. And another fruit from last week was the assurance of salvation, the confidence that I am God's and God is mine. And we learned, and it's just so meaningful to me when Pastor Jeff talked and, and preached last week about this, because it is not historical proof that builds up our assurance. It is not that somebody just wrote a book saying that they went to heaven and came back. What builds our assurance is an ongoing, vibrant relationship with Jesus by His Spirit. So I hope that you're seeing a theme as we move through this series, and I want to just sort of put it in a sentence. It is that the Spirit-filled life is not a religious plateau we attain, and I say that, by the way, because in the religions of the world, you always have this religious plateau. It's a journey to Mecca or it's nirvana. Whatever it is, it's this plateau that only few people ever reach. But with a spirit-filled life is not a religious plateau we attain, but a loving relationship that we maintain. It is not a moral product that we're aiming for, as if the point were just to become better people. Oh, he's a good person. The point is intimacy with God, our Creator. So, 
this high bar in mind, the promise for every one of you that you can be closer in communion with the one who made you. It is with that high bar that I want to look today at obstacles to that life and to that promise that God has for you. Before we do that and and move into these obstacles, I want to ask a bit of a probing question for you to think about. And it's a question that I, I believe God sort of put to me this week. Has anything changed in your life as a result of this sermon series? What I mean is, I'm sure there have been times when you, you've heard about we need to create more time for God. We need to be more attentive to His presence. We need to uh, abide in Jesus and stay with Him. And, and perhaps you've had some aha moments throughout the series where God has said, you need to do this. You need to change. And I just want to ask you pointedly, have you changed anything in your life since this series started? Are you doing anything intentionally to have your life be different than it has been? You know, um, in our family, we have been in a season where I'm becoming quite familiar with the obstacles to getting a car started. Now, recently for us, it's been uh, the transmission. It's been tires that are, that are about to explode. Um, it's been humming noises as you're driving and wobbling. It's been the battery. It's been the clutch. It's really everything. I'm thinking in a couple years, I'll, I'll start a side business as a mechanic. If any of you need help with that, I'm picking it up. But uh, as we face these different obstacles to getting our cars started, I've noticed along the way that there's always a point of decision, which usually means money, by the way. But, you know, I can be aware of the problem, right? I can say, wow, my wife almost got stuck at the store because the battery is dying. I can research solutions on YouTube. I can talk to mechanics. I can do all of that. But something has to actually happen if I want my car to change the way it's behaving. I have to actually do something to see change come about. And as many of you know, if you just wait for your car to get better, what happens? It never does. It just gets worse. And so when it comes to the spiritual life, we often just assume that it will manage itself. Or that if there is some problem in our life, that that God will work it out behind the scenes of our conscious life. That God will just take care of it. Maybe we become aware of some part of our spiritual machinery that is sputtering or seizing up on us. But we just kind of wait longer many times. Or we say, I'll just hear another sermon and it'll go away. But you might have noticed it really doesn't, does it? Until we actually do something different. For those of us us with cars, doing something different usually means going to the mechanic. And I just want to say before we move into this topic today that God, for his children, for anyone who is in Jesus, God has given you a resident mechanic, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who who knows the mind and the hearts of men and women, who understands the way that they work, the deception, the good, the bad, all of it, and who knows what needs to happen for change to occur. And so I just want to, in in light of this question, have you done anything differently in the last several weeks as a result of what you've heard? I just want uh, to encourage you and me that you would cooperate with the Holy Spirit, allow Him to show your soul where it may be misfiring. And as you become aware of that, ask Him for specific steps and be willing to take them in order to see change happen in your life. And the whole purpose of that, right, remember, is deeper intimacy with God. So, four obstacles to the Spirit-filled life is what I want to look at this morning. I know there's probably tons and there's little nuances and dynamics of every one. Each one of you has a different experience of this. But for me, it came down to four. So here's the first. One of the greatest obstacles to the Spirit-filled life is an undisciplined mind. Colossians chapter 3, Paul writes to the Christians in this town, and he says to them, set your minds 
on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Now, I don't suppose Paul wanted them all to just sit in this meditative state for the rest of their lives, not go to work, not talk to people around them. But there was an intentional setting of the mind that Paul and that God wants us to do. How many times in a day do you feel like your mind is just hijacked by a random thought? Anybody? And maybe one random thought to the next, to the point where you just kind of think, I don't think there's any way really to control what's going on in my mind. It's just things come in and they go out. But God tells us in his word that we can have control. And if we want to experience the spirit-filled life, we must learn to manage what goes on in our minds. Now, I can agree with probably all of you that this is not an easy thing, right? And I just want to talk today a little bit about why this is so difficult. And the reason is because your mind is not neutral ground. The picture I get, and I don't know if this is going to make any sense, but it makes sense in my mind. Uh, my wife and I went to Hawaii last year. We had kind of the tickets paid for. We had really no choice but to go. But uh, um, Dennis and Darlene Richards watched our kids for us. But we were in Hawaii, and it was all of Reese's family. And I just remember these times of sitting around the, the, the room, the timeshare, and saying, what do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? And I mean, most of the time, we just all kind of hung out. There was no opinion. There was no push or pull. And, and I thought to myself, man, it would be great if it were that easy with the mind. Oh, I'm just going to stop thinking about bad things. I'm going to start thinking about good things. But the very sober reality is that there is a war going on inside every one of our minds. There's a battle. And it's serious. We don't see it, and so we tend to minimize it or we just forget about it. But in Romans chapter 7, it says that, that your sinful nature, everybody has a sinful nature, even Christians. There is a nature inside of you that is constantly waging war against your mind to keep you from doing the good you want to do. Can anyone relate to that feeling? I want to do that. I, I, I intended to do that. What happened? We are at war in our minds, and our sinful nature will do everything it can to keep us from setting our minds on things above. Why else do you think that it is so easy to take in two hours of Tom Cruise with popcorn, but as soon as you pull out your Bible, your eyelids get heavy? It's because there's a war. There's a war going on, and that is why when you look at the Bible and you read from Old Testament to New Testament, which we're going to do in a second, not all of it, <laughs> but, but all throughout Scripture, you see God urging people through his, writer, through his prophets and through the writers of Scripture to be proactive, to be aware of what is going on in their mind, to be diligent about where they put their thoughts and where they let their mind go. And so here are some examples. First Chronicles chapter 22. King David is talking and addressing all of the leaders of Israel. And he says this to them in First Chronicles 22 verse 19. Set your mind and heart to seek the Lord your God. David knew the realities that they were going to face. He knew they were going to be pulled in every direction just like we are. And so he, he exhorted them to set their minds and their heart to seek the Lord. Isaiah chapter 26 has a, a wonderful promise for all of us. 26 verse 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. How many of you would love perfect peace? It happens when our minds are stayed set on God. Matthew chapter 16, we're familiar with this episode where Peter comes to Jesus and he basically says, you don't have to die on the cross, Jesus. There's a way around this. And Jesus turns to Peter in Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 16 verse 23, turns to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. Referring to the influence behind which Peter was speaking and he says, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Now, the problem here is not that Peter is a horrible person. We tend to pick on these biblical things and say, oh, bad job, Peter. 
But just like every single one of us, Peter here was just reasoning with human thinking. He was setting his mind on human thoughts. You don't want to die. We're going we're to protect you from the cross. No, that's not what God wants. One more verse. Philippians 4, verse 8, Paul writes to the Christians in this, in this town, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. I want you to understand today that what Paul is asking the believers to do is to be discriminating. That's a word that is not very popular these days, is it? And the wrong kind of discrimination is not good. But God wants us to make judgments about the things that we look at, the things that we listen to, the things that we think about. So I would just ask this morning, how does your relationship with Jesus affect your decisions about what you watch on TV, about what movies you watch, about what you look at on the internet, what you listen to in music? Does it make any difference that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you? Or if, or if you were to just put you next to somebody who didn't have Christ, would it just kind of be the same thing? You know, our society here would say, who cares? It's just entertainment. In other words, it's neutral ground, right? But the reality is that if you fill your minds with unlovely thoughts, you'll you'll become an unlovely person. If you look at unlovely things, you'll think about unlovely things, and then one thing will lead to another, and the Spirit-filled life will always be just out of reach. You know, I don't think this whole discussion of being strict about our minds, what we watch, and and things like that gets enough credit in the church today. And I honestly think because it's always just quickly labeled as legalism. And why? Now, there's such a thing as legalism. It's trying to earn your salvation. It's trying to build up your own righteousness and your own reputation. But many times we call things legalistic because they're hard. We want it to be easy. We like Jesus and, 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 and love your neighbor and don't judge skateboarders. And, I mean, some of the ways people use Jesus to create an easy life for themselves is crazy. When you look at everything that he said, it's hard. And it's not legalistic. It's just following Jesus. You see, what is at stake here? is not to be a better Christian. I think that's another piece of legalism. I'm making myself a better person. What is at stake here is the abundant life that you and I are meant to experience on a daily basis. It's this expansive, fulfilling, incomparable life that God promises to us. And part of the experience, a big part of the experience of that life revolves around what we do with our minds. Romans 8, verse 6, Paul says, To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Which do you prefer? You see, it's not just about I'm saved and I have my ticket to heaven. It's about our practical experience. If you are living in a flesh-rooted mode, you will experience the fruits of death. Now, you may feel like you have the good life because you have lots of things, but on the inside, it's just going to produce death and more death. Whereas if we set our heart on the Spirit and the things of God, you're going to experience life and peace. And that is what's at stake, not being more religious or good so people respect you. None of that. I uh, I need to move on. (laughs) But uh, another obstacle to the Spirit-filled life, number two, unspiritual thing. This is what happens when we are, we are so taken up with the things of the world that we start living in ways that are contrary to what we say we believe. Actually contrary to the Spirit. 
1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is writing again to Christians. He's writing these to Christians, and he says this, I could not address you as spiritual people. That's kind of an ouch right there. I could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? Did you know that there could be such a thing as an unspiritual Christian? Now, that does not mean that you don't have the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches that every Christian has the Holy Spirit, but there is such a thing as as not living like it, right? It reminds me of, of, of the song and how Pastor Robbie led us in that song, and he said, Uh, welcoming. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. And it just occurred to me in the first service that, that it is possible to have somebody in your house sitting on your couch, and you're just walking around the house doing all kinds of other stuff, and they're sitting there going, why am I here? You can have the Holy Spirit and live in an unspiritual way. A spiritual Christian is someone who is tuned in to spiritual things, who is listening for God. It's a person who's who's thinking about the things that God thinks about and, and loving and pursuing the things that God loves. A spiritual Christian is someone who, when God shines the light on a particular sin in their life, they repent. They do something about it. It affects them. You know, I I heard a, a great sermon yesterday on the radio, just a little snippet of it, but enough to really be meaningful. And this pastor was making the case that that God said about David that David was a man after God's heart. And this pastor brought out the point that God, who knew David's life from the beginning to the end, he knew David was going to kill a person, essentially, and commit adultery. And he said about this man, he is a man after my own heart. And what this pastor pointed to that made him that way was he knew how to repent. He knew how to turn to God when sin was highlighted in his life. And you see here in this 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says, when there is jealousy, when there is jealousy among you, aren't you just behaving in a human way? And maybe for you it's not jealousy. Maybe you can't relate to that. Maybe it's lust. Maybe for you it is, it is greed. Maybe there's just been this lifelong desire for more. And when you look back, there's this just all it's ever been for you. I need more. And if I, if I just have a little more, then I'll be good. That's greed. Maybe it's pride. But whatever that is, a spiritual Christian is someone who is willing to turn, to do something about it. You know, if we're honest, we all are unspiritual from time to time, right? And the question is, how do we change our way of living? It goes back to our first point. It's by changing our way of thinking. I want you to look at another verse that will be up on the screen. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Paul says, Do not be conformed to the world. By the way, that is in a snapshot what unspiritual living is. Yeah, you've got the Spirit, but you just look like everybody else. And Paul says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. How? By the renewal of your, what? Mind. The way that God has ordained for you to become different, to become set apart in this world is by the renewing of your mind. And what happens when your mind is renewed, if you keep reading, is so that you, by testing, this is discrimination, by the way, you are discriminating, by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So the way to be transformed from an unspiritual person into a spiritual person is to saturate your mind with God's Word. To saturate your mind with thoughts of God. And not just God, but anything that is pure and noble and excellent. Remember from Philippians 4? Look in the world and if you see something beautiful, set your mind on it and thank God for it. That is how we become different and we become changed. Well, number three, 
This particular obstacle to the spirit-filled life has been probably the most meaningful to me this week, and it is undeveloped spiritual senses. When I was in high school, I played football, and in one of the practices, I fell and I caught, I landed entirely on this thumb, and it just snapped my thumb sideways. And so I had some broken bones in here, and I had a cast on probably halfway up my arm for several months. And I had been lifting weights twice a day. Yes, believe it. Uh, but I was a scrawny little guy, so he wouldn't have known anyway. But um, I was lifting weights twice a day up till that point, and then I had this cast in my arm. And after a couple months, I got the cast off, and I went back to lifting weights. And what do you think happened? noticeable difference in how much weaker my right arm was. And the reason for this, as many of you have experienced with the similar situation, is that when you don't use a muscle, it atrophies. It shrivels up. And it's the same thing with our spiritual senses. Maybe you would say this morning, all this talk of hearing God's voice, I can't hear God's voice. I don't know what God's voice sounds like. And I would just say to you, how often do you try? In what specific ways are you intentionally trying to hear God's voice? In other words, do you exercise that part of who you are? Every one of us spiritual senses, just as certain, just as real as our physical senses. But most of the time, our physical sense are so bombarded that A.W. Tozer, in this, in this book I'm about to read a quote from, he says that our physical senses are constantly demanding to be accepted as final. They're constantly saying, this is all there is to life. And they're filling us with this world. But speaking of Tozer, this book, The Pursuit of God, is my favorite book. And I would just recommend it uh, to everybody. If you haven't read it, pick it up and read it. It is very much related to the sermon series we're in and just the Christian life in general. But in this book, Tozer addresses the question of how come some Christians just seem to have it all together? Those super spiritual Christians, you're like, man, how do they do it? And why do other people struggle along? Well, Tozer addresses it, and I just want to read from this book, and it'll be up on the screen for you. Why do some people find God in a way that others do not? Why does God manifest His presence to some and let multitudes of others struggle along in the half-light of imperfect Christian experience? Of course, the will of God is the same for all. He has no favorites within His household. All he has ever done for any of his children, he will do for all of his children. So the difference lies not with God, but with us. Now follow this. I venture to suggest that the one vital quality which great saints of the past had was spiritual receptivity. Something in them was open to heaven. Something which urged them Godward. They had spiritual awareness, and they went on to cultivate it until it became the biggest thing in their lives. They differed from the average person, I would say the average Christian, in that when they felt the inward longing, they did something about it. They acquired the lifelong habit of spiritual response. So I would say that the main difference between a mature Christian and an immature Christian is not perfection, but spiritual responsiveness. It's the ability to hear and respond to God's promptings and His voice by the Holy Spirit. As Tozer puts it, it's cultivating our spiritual awareness so that it becomes the biggest thing in our lives. I want to just stop there. Can you imagine what that would be like if your spiritual senses were the most dominating feature of your existence? What would that be like in this culture especially? 
Talk about transformation. And I love that the, the words that Tozer uses. This is not an overnight thing. He says we must cultivate and it will become the biggest thing in our lives as we acquire the lifelong habit of spiritual response. I want to share a story from when I was in college to sort of illustrate this. When I went to the uh, Alliance Church in Bozeman where Pastor Dan was the preacher, and um, there was a season there that was very vivid to me where after the sermon and the worship, I would be so enriched. And on my way home, every Sunday, I would hear this voice, God's voice, and he would be saying, stay with me. Stay with me. You see, many times after a Sunday morning, we give God his hour and whatever, and then we're off to our own lives. And God is still with us. You might not know the difference. And I just remember this season of God whispering, stay with me. And I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. But I would go home and I would sit on this recliner in my apartment and I would just open up my Bible. And most of the time I would just read a verse of a psalm, one verse. And I would just sit there on my chair and think about it. And lots of times I would doze off thinking about it because I was tired. But when I woke up, my Bible was there on my chest and I'd look at it again and I just want to share and encourage you from personal experience that this was one of the most transformative times in my Christian life. And it wasn't complicated. I didn't spend five hours in that chair. But where it all started was hearing that little voice and doing something about it. Psalm chapter 27, verse 8, David captures this idea so well of spiritual responsiveness. He says, you have said, seek my face. By the way, whatever the, the um, derivative is of seek my face, that is what God is saying to every one of you. Come away with me. Stay. Stay here. Seek my face. You, God has said and God is saying and he's whispering it. Seek my face. And David says, my heart says to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do you see the responsiveness? Okay, I will. That is what made David a man after God's heart. He responded to God. You know, the worst thing you can possibly do this morning and in this series is to accept the reality of where you're at. It's to look at, at those super spiritual people and co conclude that you're just not as gifted as them or that God has better plans for their life than he has for your life. That's a lie, okay? If you want to train for a marathon, the first step is the one that takes you out the front door. Start small. And so I just want to ask, what small step can you take? And we're going to actually pray at the end about this together. What small step can you take to cultivate your spiritual senses? Maybe it's this afternoon in a chair. And you just sit there and say, God, what do you want me to do? Maybe it's tomorrow morning. You get up earlier and you go for a walk or something. I don't know how you're put together. But let it be something. And I just want to warn you before we move to this last obstacle that it's going to be hard at first. And here's why. What happens when you start exercising a muscle that you've never exercised or not in a while? It gets sore. First of all, it's not going to be able to do what you want it to do, right? Lots of us, we, like for me, I start exercising, I get a membership, and then two weeks later, I'm like, oh, this is dumb. Because <laughs> I had this vision of grandeur. I had this vision of being able to bench press a bunch of weight and to run the mile at X amount of time, and it just doesn't happen. And so I give up. And then I go back and I try again, but... It's going to be hard because it's, your, your spiritual senses aren't going to do what you want it to do in the beginning. And you're also going to get really sore, which I would equate to feeling crazy. Where you're sitting there going, what am I listening for? You know, it's like the crickets and, you know, and, and it's going to be weird. 
It can be weird. You know, it's like when you have those, those retreats and, the, and the, the leader of the retreat says, okay, now I want you to go spend uh, two hours with, with nothing. What? I can't take my phone? It's just like so bizarre for us. And I think that's some of the soreness, the growing pains into this spiritual life. And the final reason I think it's going to be hard is because it's going to require sacrifice. There's so much coming into our lives. And let's face it, we love being busy as a people. We love filling our lives with so much stuff. And and we sort of deceive ourselves into thinking that we can just do it all. So right now, maybe you just made a note, you know, add spiritual receptiveness to list. You're just going to pile that on top of everything else. Probably not. It's like taking a five-gallon bucket and pouring it into a one-gallon jar. It's only ever going to hold one gallon of liquid. And so it's being realistic. It's saying, you know what? I'm going to have to time out on my physical senses. I'm going to have to shut off my phone. (laughs) I did not plan that. (laughs) Honestly, I wondered why you were laughing. I was like... It's not funny. Oh, (laughs) it's happened to all of us, or a lot of us anyway. Um, But anyway, if you want to cultivate your spiritual senses, there's going to be some sacrifice. And I don't know what that is for you, but God will make that clear if you're willing to to hear him. One more, one more obstacle to the spirit-filled life, and here it is. The fourth obstacle to the spirit-filled life is focusing on obstacles to the Spirit-filled life. Now, you might be saying, okay, thanks, Micah, so you're preaching on it, and now I'm not supposed to think about it. But I would say there's a difference in being aware of something and thinking about it and in fixating on it. When I was in Bozeman, and another Bozeman story, it's where I grew up, but when I was in Bozeman, I rode motorcycles with a friend of mine. And we would go riding and just kind of casual riding. And one day he said, hey, let's ride up over the Bridger Mountains. And there's this path that takes you up on top of Ross Pass, which is that uh, saddle in the mountains. And I'm like, oh, sure, yeah, I can do that. And I, I, I hit every rock on the way up. There were, there were big boulders and the path was so narrow going through these, uh, these rocks. And I was falling over and I was hitting rocks that didn't exist, I'm pretty sure. And finally, my friend comes back down to me, because he's, he's quite a ways ahead, and he asked me, he said, this, this wasn't a guy that I would say was overly spiritual, honestly. This came out of the blue, but he said, Micah, where are you looking? And I had no idea what he was getting at, but I said, um, the rocks, they're huge, they're everywhere. And he said, oh, Micah, you always look where you want to go. And that has never left me because it's so many times in my spiritual life where I feel overwhelmed by my shame. Just like we sang earlier, my shame is undone. And I begin to focus on that thing in my life. And what happens? I stay with that thing. But if we want to move toward Jesus, we have to fix our eyes on Jesus. We have to fill our hearts with his word. And his truth, that has to be what we're about. So that we're not Christians who are known for what we're against. We're known for what we're for. We are going toward Jesus. And that is when we will be transformed and will be changed. You know, next week I'm excited to preach again. Because next week is how to live a victorious Christian life. And I feel totally inadequate to talk about that. But... I'm excited for it because God never tells us just to avoid something. He always gives us something to pursue, to do. And that's going to be a part of victory, but we'll get there later. Um, One more verse before we close. Psalm 16, verse 8. David, again, the man after God's heart, says, I have set the Lord always before me. Not my adultery, not my murder. I have set the Lord always before me because He is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. And speaking of where our focus is this morning as we leave, the solution is not just to try harder. The solution is the cross. 
The good news, guys, is the gospel. It's that, it's that Jesus was punished by his Father purposely for all of our sin. The sins that we have committed, the sins that we've thought in our minds, all of it went on Jesus and the cross. And in exchange for the filthiness, the filthiness of our hearts, Jesus said, here's my righteousness. Here's my perfection. And that is the only reason the Holy Spirit dares to live inside any of us. Not because you're good. Not because you're special. But because Jesus is special. And what Jesus did and is doing in you is special. That's the gospel. The gospel is believing that the Holy Spirit is in your heart by choice. His arm was not twisted into coming into you. Oh. He wants to be there. He wants to see you change. And he is committed to it. Well, let's pray. God, we believe your gospel. We believe, Lord, that there is absolutely no way any one of us is going to just whip our mind into shape or whip our life into shape or Just have our ears open up to your voice. All of this, God, is by your power. And so we just open up our hands and we open up our hearts to be changed. God, help us not just to hear these words and so deceive ourselves, but help us to listen and to do, to do something today about what we've heard. Lord, we fix our eyes on you and we believe that your power in us will produce what is pleasing to you. I want you to just, um, we have some time, and I want you to uh, get into a small group. It could be the person next to you. It could be uh, three or whatever. But I just want you to pray with each other. And I don't want to tell you exactly what to pray because I believe that God will lead you in this. But Pray for somebody near you that God would make them more aware of his presence. That God would open your ears and your eyes, those spiritual senses, to hear him and to see him this week in a way that you never have before. And I know we don't do this often, but this is uh, to be called a house of prayer, as Jesus said. And so why don't we pray? Just take a few minutes Get together with somebody near you. Turn toward the person next to you. You can turn around. Pray for someone. And then we'll worship.